Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Come on in, come on in and find a seat. Thank you so much for gathering with us. Come on in and find a seat from the hallway. Grab yourself a seat, bring in your coffee, it's okay, we're glad you're here. If you are a visitor with us this morning, we're especially thankful you are joining us. Uh, thank you for coming and joining our worship gathering here at Lebanon Baptist Church. If, if you are a first time guest, we'd love to know that you are here and there's a code above my head. If you scan that code and let us know you came, uh, we would love to send you a little gift in an email. It's a coupon for a free cup of coffee at Crazy Love Coffee House. So if you're a guest this morning, thank you for coming. Scan that. Let us know you're here, and we'd love to send you a free cup of coffee uh, for being with us this morning just as a thank you. Well, I do have a lot of thank yous to say today to the church, especially regarding Vacation Bible School. Uh, this week, we had a great week of Vacation Bible School. We had, um, initially, we had a 120 people scheduled in our registrations, um, but on Thursday we had 140 come. And we actually had, I believe, even more than that. If you look at the total amount of kids who came, I believe we had even more than 140 uh, kids who came. And so uh, the beautiful thing about that is that they heard the gospel. And they heard that God is their creator and that he loves them, that he's holy and righteous. They heard about their need of a savior. They've sinned and broken God's law, but God has sent a rescuer, Jesus Christ, to deal with our sin. He died and rose again. And that message, my brothers and sisters, is a message that can change your life. And they heard how they must respond in faith and repentance. And so we rejoice that the gospel goes, went forth. You know what? We're not saviors. We can't save anybody, but we know, do know who can. And that message of the gospel that was planted this week, what we need to pray for is that it will bring forth more fruit and really pray for connections, ongoing connections from VBS that things would go well. But I just want to say a huge thank you to all of the volunteers who made this week possible. You guys are a solid rock. Lebanon always shows up big when uh, we need them. And it just went so smoothly. I'd like to thank Crystal Madlam, who was my right-hand lady who made everything go smoothly. Crystal, thank you for your ministry and investment, not just organizing, but also spiritually. She was leading a lot of prayer times together and making sure our volunteers had our, their minds in the right place. So uh, thank you to all. And we have a little video to show you just of the week.
had a lot of fun together. Oh, there I am. Oh, we can see that we had a lot of fun together, and we also got to share the wonderful gospel. So thank you to all of the VBS volunteers. Um, just so you know, if you didn't know, new Life Stage classes started today. They're up on the screen. In Adult 1, we did How to Study the Bible. Adult 2, Christians in the Workplace. And Adult 3, The Promises of God. And we've only gone through the first session, so you haven't missed too much. If you'd like to join Join us next week at 9.30. Please come. And then on the 31st, which is next Sunday, we're going to have a baptism Sunday. And so if you need to be baptized and you've placed your faith in Christ but need to be baptized, contact me or Josh or the church office this week so we can get you in and uh, you can be baptized next week. For summer of service, there's a car wash this Wednesday from 5 p.m. to about 6.30, I believe. And um, you'll want to contact um, Ross Wallach and let him know you are coming. What Just a little cool story Pastor Brian sent along to us that somebody who went through the car wash and met the church and connected there is now coming to the Wednesday night Bible study with the college and career group because the church had served them in the car wash and made a connection. So these are wonderful, wonderful things that can happen. And so if you'd like to help serve our community and show love to them, come to the car wash at 5 p.m. Uh, tonight, there we're continuing our summer uh, PM series in 1 John. Tim Pulver is going to be preaching. After he gets done preaching, we're going to have a fellow fellowship time together. In the fellowship hall, there will be pizza, which if you haven't signed up yet and you're coming, you need to let us know ASAP and board games or card games. You bring whatever makes your heart happy, okay? Settlers of Catan, Ticket to Ride, Dominion, Rook, Uno, okay, sky's the limit. Whatever you want, you bring tonight. And maybe we could get some kids' games too. If some of you parents with kids, you could bring your games as well. And we're just going to have a really relaxed time together tonight. And then finally, our usher greeter team needs more help. So if you can help with the ushers and greeters as people come in um, at the doors, please let um, Pastor Josh know and he can connect you with the right people. Well, that is all of the announcements, and uh, now we're going to transition into why we've gathered here today. You may have noticed Pastor Brian's not here, so it's just Josh and I today. Don't be afraid, okay? Josh is going to be preaching, and uh, the theme of our gathering is this. Really, it's about knowing Jesus Christ. Paul wrote these words in Philippians 3, 7, and 8, but whatever I had gained... Earthly speaking, whatever I had gained, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Brothers and sisters, there is a lot that can captivate our heart in this world. The world offers us pleasures that make us think we're going to be happy, make us think we're going to be satisfied, but all the world can offer you and me is empty promises, but there is someone who can satisfy your heart. There is someone that is more beautiful and more wonderful and more satisfying than anything this world could ever hope to offer you, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. He is a deep well. He is a treasure chest of glory, and he can satisfy our hearts, but we have to have our hearts in the right position. We have to have our hearts wanting to know him more. And when we seek the Lord with all of our hearts, you will find him, and you'll be satisfied by him. Let's pray together. Father, we pause now to give you thanks Thank you for giving us your son, Jesus. <clears throat> In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He's the only one that could fill that God-shaped hole in our heart that we keep on trying to fill with other things. Lord, I pray that you would help us today to remember once again that all that glitters is not gold, that this world is peddling 
it's, it's treasures in front of us that are really fool's gold that never end up satisfying our deepest longings. And Lord, may we remember Christ who in him is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and him is the surpassing worth greater than everything and anything we could hold dear in this world. Lord, may our hearts seek him. May he be lifted up today as we sing together, as we pray, as Josh opens the word. Lord, open our hearts to behold wonderful things from your law. And I pray that you would satisfy us this morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice in you and be glad all our days. And it's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. Well, let's all stand together, and we're going to begin by singing, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph. Jesus the Savior reigns, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our stains, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. is king and he's reigning over everything because he died and rose again. Let's sing together hallelujah for the cross. Up to the hill of Calvary my Savior went courageously and there he bled and died for me. Hallelujah for the cross and on that day the world was changed a final perfect lamb was slain let earth and heaven now proclaim hallelujah for the cross hallelujah for the war he fought love is won death has lost hallelujah for the souls he bought, hallelujah, for the cross. What good I've done could never save, my debt too great for deeds to pay. But God, my Savior, made a way, hallelujah, for the cross. A slave to sin, my life was bound, but all my chains fell to the ground. When Jesus' blood came flowing down, hallelujah for the cross, hallelujah for the war he fought, love has won, death has lost, hallelujah for the soul.
my final breath, I'll have no need to fear that rest. This hope will guide me into death. the cross of Jesus that dealt with our sins. It is his resurrection that gives us new life, new desires to know him more. Let's sing together. I want to know you. I've tried in vain a thousand ways, my fears to quell, my hopes to raise. But what I need is ever only Jesus. You die to live, you reign, you plead. There's love in all your words and deeds. This weary heart finds all
that was a new song for, how many of you that was a new song for you? All right, quite a few of you, um, but a very good song. I do not have my, uh, my mic on, by the way, I'm using the pulpit mic. Um, our passage this morning um, that we're going to be studying actually fits perfectly with that song, so I really enjoyed learning that song. And so I'd like us to open up to Ephesians chapter 4, and for our scripture reading this morning, I'm going to read the beginning section, and then we will read the particular section that I'm going to deal with um, during the during the message time. But Ephesians chapter four, Ephesians is a marvelous, marvelous book. Uh, if you want to learn about church, what is the church? What is God doing in and through the church? What's the purpose of the church? Dive into Ephesians. Uh, you will not be disappointed. Um, it is a deep book. You can dive in very deeply into this book, uh, but it will be life to you if you do that. And uh, you, will, you will gain insight and understanding into what God is doing on this earth for his glory through the church. Ephesians chapter 4, let's begin reading in verse 1. And we'll read all the way through verse 11. It says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended to the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. We'll stop there. Would you pray with me this morning that the Lord would use this text of Scripture, Ephesians chapter 4, to equip us, to change us, to transform us, and help us be a healthy, unified, and maturing body of believers. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are fully dependent on you as our head. Lord, we need you to open our eyes to see and to understand uh, this text of Scripture. Lord, as this chapter opens, there is such a need for unity. There is such a need for peace within a body of believers. And I pray, Lord, that Lebanon Baptist Church will be characterized by unity and peace. Because we all are partakers of the gift of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the same Lord. And Lord, I pray that our church will be characterized by the type of unity described here, where we are together of one mind, of one accord. And Lord, that we would be exercising our gifts that you've given us to build each other up, to encourage one another, to strengthen each other. Lord, I ask that you would help our church to be one that is flavored and filled with love for one another. 
that we would not let squabbles, fights, preferences, irritations get into this body and cause division. Cause team building. Cause bitterness and frustration, gossip, slander. But rather there would be an eagerness amongst all of us to maintain unity to maintain peace. And Lord, we need that through your spirit. We need that by your grace. You've gifted us so that that's possible. You've gifted us to be a a gospel-centered, Christ-honoring, loving community of believers. So I pray that you'd help us to grow into that maturity. Lord, we need your grace for this. I pray you'd help us as we continue in our worship service, as we sing songs, that our hearts would be encouraged. As we hear the word taught that we would uh, have a point to anchor our beliefs in, in the scriptures, that we'd understand it and see clearly how we ought to be living. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. Our final hymn is going to be, All I Have is Christ. I once was lost in Thank you. you. can be seated. At this time, we would like to dismiss our kids K-4 through the second grade out the back doors. And parents, if you're new to our gathering, you can pick up your children down this hallway at the conclusion of our gathering. Thank you. Well, good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. I'm glad you all are here, because if you weren't here, I wouldn't be here. I 
I am very excited about our text of scripture this morning that we get to dive into. Uh, let me explain kind of what we're doing, though. Uh, throughout the last several months, we have been kind of peppering in or salting in or sprinkling in, however you want to think about it, uh, a kind of a, an ongoing series on our core values as a church. What is our church uh, value? And we've hit different aspects of those core values. Uh, and that series is, was entitled Embracing Our Mission. And um, our mission, just to review, this is great to review. We probably can't say it enough. Our mission is to make disciples of Jesus for the glory of God. Okay, that, that's why we're here. That's why we exist, is to make disciples of Jesus for the glory of God. So our values then are the biblical priorities we must embrace in order to fulfill this mission. Okay, so what are the priorities that we as a church need to fulfill or need to have in order to see this mission realized? And that's where this series has come in to show you those. Uh, in particular, though, the foundational value is biblical truth. Because we want all of our values to come out of that. We want all of our, our priorities to come directly from Scripture and not just, uh, you know, how to grow a business or how to grow a small, you know, group of people into a, you know, and, 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 and make progress in developing, you know, who knows what. We really want it to be from the Bible, and it's related specifically to his, Jesus' church, okay? So biblical truth, we want all these values to come out of that. And so here's kind of an overview. I don't know if you can read all those. They're kind of small. But here's our other values. So along with biblical truth, we have corporate worship, uh, constant prayer, committed discipleship, spiritual unity, faithful stewardship, and intentional evangelism. Uh, so for today, uh, the one that we're going to be jumping into is committed discipleship. We're going to be talking about committed discipleship this morning. And so we are going to be looking at a text in Ephesians chapter 4. Now, there's lots of different aspects of discipleship and committed discipleship that we could discuss. Uh, the way we've phrased it here is we help each other follow Jesus through the prayerful ministry of the Word in the context of loving relationships. Okay? A lot, there's lots of little pieces there, right? We help each other follow Jesus through the prayerful ministry of the word in loving relationships. Um, we're not going to be able to deal with every aspect of that today. Uh, in fact, I'm not necessarily just going to speak on committed discipleship as a whole. I'd like to actually speak from the text in Ephesians chapter 4, but it applies directly to committed discipleship, and I think you'll see that very clearly as we jump into this. If you're here and you're wondering what, you know, What's Lebanon Baptist Church all about, right? What, what, do you guys, what do you guys value? What do you guys consider? I'm hoping that as we've gone through this series, that it's strengthened your understanding of what church is, what churches should be doing, what churches should be valuing, how churches should be operating. And in particular, as we jump into committed discipleship, what I'm praying that all of us will do is really evaluate this. <laughs> Am I committed to discipleship? <laughs> okay. Our value is committed discipleship. Am I committed to discipling, to making disciples, to being a disciple? There's lots of, again, different aspects we could look at. But let's look now at our text this morning. So we're going to be taking a, a portion of chapter 4 and diving kind of deeply into it. And what I want to do... I started reading just a little bit ago in, in chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to read through verse 16, and I want to hit two primary points, okay? Point 1 and point 2. I'll show you what those are in just a second. Each one of those points has some development underneath it, but what I'm going to be doing is slowly zooming in on the text, okay? A little bit more and a little bit more. And after the second point, as we develop that, we're going to zoom in specifically on one particular verse. And we're going to spend some time in that verse this morning as well. Okay. Why am I telling you this process? Here's why. As you interact with the Word, and the Word is crucial for discipleship. As you interact with the Word, I think it's really important that you wrestle with the Scripture. I mean, all of us have been there where we're reading through a portion of Scripture, and it's like, you know, we hit one of those verses that we really like, that we've heard you know, a bunch, maybe we even have it memorized, and we're like, oh, that felt good. Mm. 
And then we go right on past that verse into the next verse, and we don't have a clue what it said or what it even meant. And it's this awkward phrase, and we're kind of like, yeah, okay, keep reading. <laughs> and we just keep going. And we kind of read that way through Scripture, where we, we read through a passage, and we're just kind of looking for those like little nuggets that we like or that we've, we're familiar with. And we grab onto those, and we're like, oh, yeah, that was good. Oh, yeah, that was good. Oh, yeah, that was good. And we don't necessarily wrestle with what is the writer of this book saying, and how is he developing what he is saying. So one of the things I think is really crucial as you read the Bible is to ask the question of every phrase, of every verse, every paragraph, do I know what he just said? <laughs> do I understand what he just said? And if there's a phrase, a sentence, a paragraph, a chapter, a whole book, <laughs> where you say, I have no idea what he just said, then that's where you dig. That's where you start digging. That's when you start asking other people. That's when you begin to, you know, study in a deeper way, start looking into word definitions and meanings and begin to draw connections and relationships within the sentence or paragraph. And you try to understand that text. So what I'm doing this morning is we are going to begin with a larger section and we're going to zoom in all the way down into one verse in particular as we go and hopefully understand what every part of that verse means. And then I want to take this, I want to go back and relate that again to discipleship. Okay? It's kind of the, a, an interesting process, an interesting layout, but that's what we're going to do this morning. So let's begin with our text. Ephesians 4, verse 11 through 16. Okay, so read with me. It says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers... To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather... Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. All right, that's our text this morning. And so my first point is this, the goal of ministry is maturity. The goal of ministry is maturity. Okay? Verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And he goes, and goes, goes on to tell you what's going on there. So before we get too deeply into 11 through 16, let me just by way of review. And he gives several points of unity. Okay? If you notice in verse 4, or 3 and 4, verse 3 he says, we're eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. All of a sudden, there's this word one that shows up a whole bunch of times, right? There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all. So this idea of one, it, it's, it's highlighting the necessity of unity, okay? The church needs to be unified, and in that unity, there is peace, Okay, there is peace, but the unity has specific content, and he lists those seven ones, right? One, 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 one. Those are all really important for unity. If, if someone thinks there's a two there, okay, instead of a one, or thinks of something totally different, okay, then unity is going to unravel and not be there. But not only does he say we're to be unified, he actually tells us that Jesus wants us to be unified, and in fact, he has given us the necessary equipment to be unified. And it talks about how Jesus has given us grace, and he's given us gifts. Verse 7, but grace was given to each one of us. Okay, so grace is given to all of us according to the measure. Now, pay attention to that word measure. We're going to come back to that in a little while. Okay, according to the measure of Christ's gift... And then it tells you why Jesus has the authority to give gifts. And it talks about how he descended to this earth. 
Okay? He died. He rose again. He's Lord over everything. And he has the total authority to give the gifts that he wants to give to whom he wants to give them. Okay? That's kind of what that verse is saying. And then it says in particular that part of the gifting of his body, the church, are specific people. Specific gifted people. And it says in verse 11, and he gave, those are part of the gifts, part of the grace given, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to do something. And it says to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Now, again, I don't have time to go into all the details of this, but let me just say this. God has equipped this church, Lebanon Baptist Church. You are fully equipped with everything you need in order to be unified, healthy, and mature. You have all the equipment needed because God has given that to you. And he's given that according to his own gracious gift. Now, one of the emphases that we're going to see in verses 12 to 16, that it states right out of the go, is that the saints are the ones who are doing the work of the ministry, not just those gifted to the church leaders. Okay? In other words, the pastors are not the ones doing ministry. Okay? Uh, the evangelists, shepherds, teachers, they're not the ones doing the ministry. They're actually supposed to be helping equip you to do the, min to do the work of the ministry. Right? And, and obviously, we're going to have to ask the question, well, what is ministry? And, and part of that is where I'm going with this whole message. So stick with me on this. But the goal of ministry, though, is what's developed in the next few verses. Okay? Now, the end of verse 12, he says it really clearly, for building up the body of Christ. Bodybuilding, all right? Bodybuilding. Now, uh, chances are if you go to the gym, which I'm assuming quite a few of you go to the gym, you may have different reasons for going to the gym. And if you go to the gym and there's a trainer there who meets you and says, hey, you know, can I help you with anything? What are you, what are you trying to accomplish? Let me help you set up a regimen. Let me help you set up routines and practices, things that you can do. Depending on your ultimate goal, he's going to adjust those regimens, right? He's going to address, adjust those exercises. If your goal is to be chiseled, right, no fat on you, and, and be, you know, win some competition, okay, then uh, he's going he's to have some, some stuff that he gives you specifically for that. Whereas if your goal is just to, like, be able to go run a mile or run two miles without keeling over, then he's going to give you a different set of instructions, right? Well, what is the goal of ministry? He says it's for the building up the body of Christ, the bodybuilding, okay? But then he's going to give us further specifics, okay? So, first point, the goal of ministry is maturity. Notice verse 13. Until, okay, so here's the goal. Here's the aim of that bodybuilding, okay? Until we all, we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. Right, there's, you see all three of these positive aspects right there. So let me go one by one through them. So, until we attain to the unity of the faith. All right. So, the aim of this bodybuilding is actually that all of us, all of us would have the same faith. Okay? Now, this is not saying the same uh, strength of faith. Okay? What it's saying is it's saying the same content of faith, right? That we would all have our faith in the same one Lord, one God and Father, that we would have our faith in him. So part of maturity, a mature congregation, a mature body of believers, they all are coming to have the same faith, all right? That's a mature group of people, is that they've all come to have the same faith. That's really important, right? So God has equipped the church. He's equipped them with people who are supposed to be helping train and, 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 and teach. But then the whole body is supposed to be building itself up so that we all have the same faith. It's one of the aims until we attain to a unity of the faith. That's the first one. The second one. He says, and of the knowledge of the Son of God. This is why I thought that song, that new song we just learned was, I mean, it was just like, it was basically a prayer <laughs> saying, I want to know you more. I need to know you more. 
The gospel of Jesus Christ is an absolute essential if this church is going to be a healthy church. And when I say the gospel of Jesus Christ, I don't just mean doctrinal statements. Okay? This isn't just a sign off on a doctrinal statement saying, yeah, I agree with you that Jesus is 100% God. He's 100% man. He died on the cross for my sins. He was buried and rose again. And he offers me life and forgiveness. And he's justified me. And he's pre- I don't mean that you can quote some type of catechism or state a doctrinal statement. This isn't just mental knowledge. This is a practical knowledge. Where actually the gospel of Jesus Christ, the knowledge of Jesus is transforming your relationships. Now, if you want to learn more specifically about how the love of God through Christ Jesus can transform your relationships, you need to come to our evening service the next two Sunday evenings. Because the topic is how the love of God transforms you so that you can love other people. It's a really clear really simple and yet practical way to understand the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Okay. So we're supposed to all attain to this, to to this one faith, a unity of faith, but then also a unity of the knowledge of the son of God. We need to be digging deeper. What does it mean that all I have is Christ? Is that really all I have? Is that really all I need? Is that all I want? Or do I want other things? Knowing and understanding what Jesus has done for you is crucial. It's going to help you be able to forgive your spouse. It's going to be able to help you be able to make right choices with your money. Right? The gospel changes everything. Do you know how that works? Do you know how the gospel changes everything? Or do you just come to church kind of hoping someone's going to feed it to you and say, you know, tithe. Oh, okay, I need to tithe. Uh, What amount? What amount should I tithe? 10%. Oh, okay, all right, 10%. Done it. Wait, do you know how the gospel influences your giving? The grace of Jesus Christ given to you affecting your giving? Or are you just looking for someone to give you these little pieces and you're like, okay, yeah, 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 I need to do that. Oh, I need to pray. Okay, I need to pray. Um, I need to read my Bible. Okay, I need to read my Bible. Or do you actually want to know Jesus more? So the goal of maturity, or the, the goal of ministry is maturity. And the, the three positive aspects are, one, that there's a unity of the faith. Two, that we've grown in this unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. But then three, to mature manhood. To mature manhood. Now, interestingly enough, the body of this group of believers is supposed to be a mature man. Now, it's not trying to be gender specific. It's just saying the group of you, y'all are supposed to be a mature body of Jesus. Singular, like a body. We need to be mature. And what it's hinting at here is that actually there is a part of our body that is already fully mature. Totally, fully mature and perfect in every way. And it's Jesus Christ. And he is the head of our body. We're just trying to catch up. Right? We're trying to look more like him. We're trying to fit with the head. As a matter of fact, look, look a little lower in verse 15. He talks about speaking the truth in love. He says, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Okay, so the, the maturing aspect is that we're growing up to actually mimic and follow our head, the mature man, Jesus Christ. That's the maturity that Paul's talking about. Okay, so those are the three positive aspects of maturity. Now, there are some negative aspects as well that he talks about. And when I say negative, it's only coming from a negative angle, but it's a positive thing. Okay, so let's look at these. Notice verse 14. Well, hold on. Pause, pause, pause. Sorry. Got ahead of myself. Okay. I want you to notice these phrases. Because again, I want you to, I want you to ask what these phrases mean. Okay. When he says to mature manhood, look what, look what he does to fill that out. Verse six, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now you're like, what? 
Is Paul just like not sure what word to use, so he used three? <laughs> what did he mean by that? All right, and again, that word measure, I want to draw your attention to that because we're going to talk about that again in a minute. All right, we've seen measure twice now. It's up in verse 7, the measure of Christ's gift. Verse 6, this idea of the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. All right. This idea is that, that Jesus is the ultimate mature person, okay? He's the, he's the ultimate head of our, the, the body of Christ, okay, the church. All right, now to those negative pieces, okay? So that, verse 14, so that we may no longer, here's the negative side, no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Okay? In other words, this maturity, unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and maturing into Christ's likeness will result in you not being like a child who's tossed by the waves. Now, you cannot get a better picture than that. If you are a parent and you've ever tried to go on vacation to the beach with little children, you know it's not vacation, right? They can literally go about six inches in the water. That's it. And it all depends on the slope of that beach too, right? And you're just like, oh, the whole time, don't drown, don't drown, don't drown, don't drown, okay? And it's amazing because, you know, you can walk in the water, like you're walking all the way up to your shoulders. And yeah, the waves are, you know, kind of lifting you off the ground a little bit and you can feel that, you know, that you feel that pull, okay? The little child who walks in there, I mean, it's, it's, it's a wave that just covers your ankles and they're like, right? Falling down, right? Water in the eyes, sand in the eyes, crying. Okay, we're going back in, all right? Paul says, hey, church, don't be babies getting crushed by every little wave of teaching out there. In other words, as a group of people are ministering to one another, it's going to bring stability to the group. You know, there's, there are so many little videos and documentaries and this and the other that all purport to be Christian and godly and the right thing. How are you to ever discern what's really going on there? You need to be anchored to the mature one, Jesus. And it's not just you individually. It's you corporately. We've got to be anchored to Jesus. Side note. Lots and lots of pressure is on pastors right now to preach a politically charged message. And if you preach a politically charged message, you're going to have a much bigger audience, probably better offerings. And you get a lot of people coming. Because people want to know, you know, if Jesus is on their side politically. That is not the job of these church leaders. We are to preach Jesus. The gospel. And if you get tired of hearing the gospel over and over, it just means that you're not seeing and you're not, you're not embracing this need to have Jesus be your anchor. You're looking for something else to hold on to, something else to identify yourself with. All right, I'm done with my side note. Okay. So the negative aspect is that we would no longer be children or neophytes or neophytic, Okay tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. I'll say one more thing about this, and that is, do you catch when people use scripture wrongly? Do you catch that? Do you take note of that? Not, not in like a judgmental, like harsh, you idiot way, okay? Not like that, like, oh my word, you're so ignorant. You don't know the context, <laughs> okay? I don't mean like that. But do you just note when someone's using scripture as leverage or force to get their own way? and to do their own thing. Can you pick up on that? Do you see that? What do you do with that? That's one of the calls of maturity is that you would exercise discernment. 
discernment. And that's one of the other negative aspects here, right? So not only are you not like blown around and just just destroyed by these waves, but when deceitful schemes, when human cunning comes into the game and they begin to take this truth and they begin to twist it or make it fit their own priorities, you're aware of it. And you know what to do with that because you are strongly connected to Christ through a local body who is building one another up according to the one faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. And that is what we're passionate about. Human cunning and by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Let me me say this. Sin is incredibly deceitful. And the only way we will make it as a church body is if we are sturdy, steady, mature believers. Okay? So, again, to this first point, the goal of ministry is maturity. Do you see that? Do you see that from the text? Am I making that up or are you guys seeing that? I want you to see it. Don't just take my word for it. Don't walk out of here and go, Pastor Josh said the goal of ministry is maturity. It must be true. Look at the text. It's like he's just saying it over and over and over. In fact, one of the commentaries I was looking at, <laughs> it, it would take all of these phrases and say, this is the immediate purpose, and this is the ultimate purpose, and this is the main goal, and the immediate goal, and had all these you know, ideas of goal and purpose because it's all over through this text. What are we trying to do? We're trying to grow, attain unto unity of the faith and of knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, growing up into the, to, to the head who is Jesus Christ, not blown about by every wave, not trapped and tripped up by deceitful schemes and human craftiness. Rather, there's something else that happens. Verse 13, or excuse me, verse 15. Here's my second point. Growth towards maturity happens as each member exercises their gift in love. Okay? Growth toward maturity happens as each member exercises his or her, their, gift in love. Let's look at verse 15. Interestingly enough, this is not the verse we're going to zoom in on. It's the next one. So, rather, it says, speaking the truth in love. You know, it's amazing. When it comes to believers exercising their gifts, there, there, there is a lot of focus on spiritual gifts. There, there has been. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, you know, our whole church taking like, you know, spiritual gifted tests, you know, where are you spiritually gifted? And, and I'm not disparaging those things and saying those things are worthless or anything like that. But the primary emphasis on scripture is actually that you'd be serving and speaking to one another. That's the emphasis. And the emphasis is that while you're doing that, you will be using the gifts God has given you. Serve and speak to one another. And in fact, I'm going to highlight the speaking part because that's what's highlighted here in this text. So you want to know what using your gift looks like, okay? It will involve speaking. Committed discipleship cannot get around speaking. If you never open your mouth, you're not a committed disciple. Okay? If you're coming to Lebanon Baptist Church and you never open your mouth and talk about the knowledge of the Son of God, or you never talk about this one faith that we have, you're not making disciples. You're not a committed disciple maker. Okay? It's easy to talk about all sorts of other stuff, right? The kids, the vacation, the sports, the work, the drama. Easy to talk about that stuff. Hard to talk about Jesus. Why? That's not a mature believer. That's not a mature congregation. A mature congregation is one where there is speaking going on. Now, I I have to be honest with you. I think a lot of times I've taken this text. I mean, speak the truth in love as in, hey, dude, I just got to tell you, you got something right between your teeth right there. It's a big old green thing. You got to get that out, right? That type of speaking the truth in love. I'm I'm just going to tell you what it is. I'm going to tell you the facts, but I'm going to do it in a kind way and not destroy you, okay? This entails that, but it's so much more. 
What truth is, is Paul so concerned about? It's the gospel. It's the unity of the faith. It's the one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. That's what he's worried about. That's what he's concerned about. He's saying, hey, guess what? If you're going to come together as a church and be a healthy church, then the speaking needs to include the truth about who Jesus is and the truth of this one faith so that we're maturing into Jesus Christ. That is the truth we're to be speaking in love. So yes, it does involve the, the, this, you know, telling the truth, but it's, it's got a specific truth in mind. And it's the truth about Jesus Christ. So again, if we don't talk about that, I mean, when's the last time, let me ask you this, when's the last time that you had a conversation with somebody about what you're learning about Jesus? Have you, have you, have you had any conversations with anybody about what you're learning about Jesus? When's the last time you had that conversation? If you can't think about it, if you can't think of when it's most recently happened, are you, are you an active, participating, healthy member in this church? Because this is a we thing. This is a we thing. And if you're not participating, help us. We're trying to be mature. We're trying to grow. We're trying to have unity. And we need you. We need everybody. Now, what I want to do now is I want to zoom in on verse 16. Because I think verse 16 kind of gives us some of those how how does this, what does this look like? Like, how can I know if I'm exercising my gift and if I'm doing this right and if bodybuilding's actually happening or if I'm just, uh, you know, drinking, drinking too much water and not actually, you know, putting in the effort to exercise. Like, what's, what's going on here? How do, I, how do I know what's going on? Okay. Verse 16 is one of those verses, I think, that sometimes we read over it and we go, yeah, I think I got that feel, but okay. Oh, that last phrase is great. Building itself up in love. Woohoo! But sometimes we kind of go, uh, yeah, okay. Not sure what to do with all that. So let's wrestle with it for just a little bit. Okay? So I'm going to read verse 15 just to ramp us into it. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. We talked about that. From whom, right? Connect that with the word previous. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. All right. There's at least six things in this verse that we can, we can dissect, okay? And we're going to do this for the remainder of the time, and then we'll finish up. All right, focusing in on verse 16. From whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Okay, how specifically does this look? What, what does this look like? Number one, Jesus is both the source and the aim. Okay, now we've already seen this, but I want you to see it from this verse. I want you to see the connections. I want you to, to know what the phrase means, right? So when it says, from whom, it's talking about Jesus. This head that we're supposed to be growing up into. Okay, so if the source of your energies of investment into the body is Jesus, then you're on the right track. And if the aim, if the aim of your investment is Jesus, then again, you're on the right track because it's from whom? It's from Jesus that this growth happens. And it's to Jesus that this growth happens. You might have all sorts of other reasons why you want growth to happen for your own benefit to make it easier to be here. Because maybe people could be a little bit more like you and you wouldn't quite feel quite so odd. Or are you more concerned about being like Jesus? Okay. From whom? This, this working effort, this, this, this energizing, this ministering to one another has to come from Jesus. He's the source, all right? The source of our efforts. Next. It says the whole body, from whom the whole body, right? So the whole body is in focus here, not the individual. Now, 
Please hear me. I am not saying individual growth is bad, but I will say this. Individual growth that's not shared with the body is immaturity. There is a really big emphasis on personal devotions and personal quiet prayer time and having your own, your own time with the Lord. And you know what? That is wonderful. You need to do that. But guess what? Do you know why you do that? You don't do that so you can feel like you just had this wonderful time with the Lord and it was so sweet. It's actually so that you can go share that with the body and help the body grow and be mature. Sometimes I wish we would stress like corporate devotions, <laughs> right? Or group devotions. Go get a friend and do devotions with a friend or talk, talk with them about it or, or have a point where you, you have somebody that you discuss what you're learning and growing with so that it becomes a, a body thing, not just an individual thing. Okay, so from whom the whole body, right? You see what I'm doing? I'm just going phrase by phrase here. From whom the whole body. Let's go to the next one. This one's a little bit, I'm, I'm, I made this statement out of two of the sections, okay? So here we go. God actively put this body together and has woven it together for unified growth. Let's look at that. Okay, so from whom the whole body, look at these next two, word, these next two ideas, joined and held together. Joined and held together. Now that word joined has the idea of a mason who's taking stones and stacking them to make a building or a structure. Now, back in these days, mortar was most likely not used. Okay, mortar was not something that they used a lot. It would have been the shaping of the stone that mattered. You shaped those stones to fit together perfectly. All right, for structural integrity and all of that, you shape the stones. You didn't count on glue holding it together. All right, I've seen some construction projects where it looks like they're just depending on the glue and the mortar to hold that together. All right, they actually shaped the stones so that they would fit together and be what is needed in the structure. And let me just tell you this God shapes his church. You've heard Brian say it over and over again we don't get to actually pick who's a member of the body of Christ. Now we affirm based on people's statement of faith and what they believe and the way that they're living, that people are indeed part of our body. But guess what? We, we, it's not like we can say, Hey, we don't like, you know, you <laughs> out. Okay. That's not how it works. God is the one who is shaping this. God is the one who's building. When he says that he's put us together, right? When he says joined, the idea is that God has intentionally crafted this body of believers right here so that it will have everything it needs for unity, maturity, stability, etc. That's that idea of that word joined, okay? Now, held together. This word, this, both of these, by the way, are participles in the Greek language. And this word in particular carries the idea of a lawyer who is preparing an argument. And he's weaving a thread throughout the whole thing to bring it all together to his conclusion to prove his point. Okay, so the idea is this, God is, is fitting, he's, he's putting together this body in such a way, and he is going to hold it together, he's drawing it together, he's the one that's going to bring it close together so that it holds and stays strong and fast. Both of them are passive, and what that means is it's something God is doing to us. Okay, from whom? Jesus. The whole body has been shaped, fashioned, put together, and is actually held together by Jesus, by the head. All right, let's keep going. Next phrase. Each member has an allotted gift. They must responsibly work. Now, this one's a little bit, it starts, this is where this verse kind of starts getting a little confusing, and you're like, okay, what's going on here? Joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. Okay. Okay. Um, by which every joint with, okay. What are we doing here? Let me, let me um, give you another translation of that little phrase that might be helpful. Through every supporting connection. Okay, so joined and held together through every supporting 
connection. Now, the word joint has been picked by many different translations, okay? And it's kind of an unfortunate word because some people think when they think joint, they think like a few. I mean, you've only got a few joints. Your, your whole body is not composed of joints, okay? But the idea is, it's a, it's a connection point. It's a touching point, okay? Now, now, hear me out. I'm not saying that we all just need to like start holding hands and touching each other's shoulders and, you know, doing big group hugs, okay? The idea here is that all these individual body parts are going to connect at some point. Connections must be made. If this body is going to be healthy, connections must be made. In other words, there's no such thing as a loner, mature Christian in a mature body. It doesn't happen. So if you don't make connections and you kind of isolate yourself, you pull back, you pull away, you don't want to be connected with people, you don't want to have those relationships where people actually talk to you about what's going on in your life, well then, hold on a minute. Wait, what, what are you doing in this body? Because this body is supposed, to be con- is supposed to be full of people who are connecting, connecting with one another. So through every supporting connection, and that, that idea of supporting, it's this word, it, think of it this way, like a, like a wife whose husband, it, specifically this word is used in this context in, in Greek outside of the Bible, but a wife who's supporting her husband who's at war. Okay, so he's away at war, and she's like, I got to support, I got to get him clothes, I got to get him what he needs, I got to support him, and as well as us, like our family. And so there's the supporting concept. So here's the idea. The idea is that all of these connections that are being made are supporting connections. Like we're connecting in a way where we're supporting one another. We're, we're undergirding each other. We're, we're pushing each other up. We're holding, we're caring for one another. While speaking. Because speaking has to be part of discipleship. And so here we are, we're connecting making connections, using our mouths and speaking, all for the purpose of building one another up into maturity, into the knowledge of the Son of God, into one faith. You see it? You see how this is working? Let's keep going. Each member has an allotted gift they must responsibly work. I want you to look at this next phrase. Okay, the whole body grows together. Pardon pardon me, going back to the number four there. Each member has a lot of gifts they must responsibly work. There is another aspect of this, and that is this phrase, okay? When each part is working properly, okay? When each part is working properly. I like that translation. Let me give you another one, okay? Another one that also works with the Greek very well, and it's this. According to the working... In measure from each individual part. I know that was a lot. Stick with me. According to the working in measure from each individual part. In other words, remember that, that, that word measure I told you to remember? That's in this verse. Okay? Your translation may not show that word measure, but it's in this verse. And so it shows up in verse 7 that Jesus is giving grace to each one of us. Every single one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So in other words, Jesus has doled out measures of gifts to people. He's just given them out. And it's according to a certain measure that he's decided. Okay? We should be using that gift to that measure, is what this is saying. Every individual working in measure with what was given to him by Jesus, okay, according to the working in measure from each individual part. So there is a need for all individuals to engage. Again, highlighting this aspect. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to just push on the individual. It's the body, but the reality is this body is made up of a bunch of individuals. It's a unique, it's a unique tension we see in Scripture, is that there's this individual aspect and this corporate aspect all together. We are one and yet many. Interestingly enough, as we do this, guess what we grow up into? We grow up into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. There's that word again. It's kind of unique to see how words are used in Scripture. 
All right. Now to the next one. The whole body grows together. Look at, the next, look at the next phrase. So it says, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow. Makes the body grow. Okay, so if you will be thinking, I'm coming from the source of Jesus. Jesus is the source of my life. He's the source of my gifting. The grace has been given to me from him. Okay? The source. I'm not just individually trying to grow. I'm trying to help the body grow. So I'm connecting. I'm, I am connecting with the whole group that God has actively shaped together and is holding together and binding together through, okay, through all of us doing our part. You see that? In other words, the thread that that lawyer was making in his argument that's going to that's gonna pull it all together and cinch it tight, the thread is actually, God's the one doing it, it's the, thre- the thread is actually all the individual members using their allotted gift to speak to one another and build each other up into this strong, sturdy, mature body. If a member decides they don't want to participate, it weakens the whole body. It weakens the whole body. The whole body grows together. And lastly, this all takes place in the context of love. This takes place in the context of love. If love is not in your heart, then be careful how you, you probably just shouldn't speak, right? Look at verse 29 real quickly. Chapter four, verse 29. It's interesting as he goes on in this argument, he's gonna bring this back up in verse 29. He says, let no corrupt, corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only, only, such as is good for the building up, as fits the occasion. Why? That it may give grace to those who hear it. Wow. So even here in this verse, just a little, little ways away, he brings in the same concept that our speaking is to be not just any speaking, it's supposed to be flavored in love for the purpose of building up. Chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Love is so important in this room and in this body. Can I tell you what will uh, destroy a church? When you're not speaking the truth or you're not speaking in love. If you're gossiping or slandering, you are going to disintegrate the unity of this church and the health of this church. It could be that some of you need to get with your spouse and just decide, you know what? Let's no longer be a part of the gossip chain. Let's not do it anymore. It's fun. Makes us feel like we're in the know. But let's just stop it. Let's just stop it. If you're not a part of the problem and you're not a part of the solution, you probably shouldn't be talking about it. General rule of thumb. Okay? Gossip and slander, hurtful speech, texts. I mean, look through your texts and ask this question Was that loving? Was that true? Or was I coming to conclusions and actually assassinating someone's character because I wasn't loving and I I actually didn't know the truth? Speak the truth in love. And in particular, remember what this truth is. The truth is about God. The Lord Jesus Christ. So... We need to be people 
who, in a context of love, speak the truth because of what God is doing. God is doing something amazing with this body of people right here, and he's fashioning us and shaping us. As we speak the truth in love, as we do this, exercising our gift, he's going to cinch us together for stability and maturity so that we grow and we won't be tossed about by everything. Instead, we'll grow up into maturity into, the, into, the, into our head who is Jesus Christ. My favorite commentator on Ephesians, Harold Horner, said this. He said, the ministry of the church is not the obligation of a few, but rather the responsibility of every believer. Guess what? All of us, we got to get involved in this. Let's not be on the sidelines saying, go, 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 minister, minister, minister. Let's also not be like, hey, pastor, you should be the one ministering. Why aren't you ministering to me? Come on. Instead, you engage. You jump in. The Bible doesn't say, go find a discipler. The Bible says, go make disciples. Let's engage in ministry. Let's engage in speaking the truth in love to one another and see the maturity of our church. So what will this mean our church prioritizes? Well, I just put down three things that are all really important. Number one, again. Number one, the preaching, teaching, and application of biblical truth. Okay? When I say prioritize, I mean prioritize. Number one, number one, and number one. Okay? So the preaching and teaching and application of biblical truth. That's what I know your pastors are going to give their hearts to that. Okay? We're going to give our hearts to making sure that we are preaching and teaching biblical truth and not just, you know, putting our finger to the wind and saying, hey, which way is, Christ, you know, cultural Christianity going? Let's follow that so we can keep a crowd. No, we're going to try to preach and teach the gospel. Also, gathering together in smaller groups to facilitate speaking the truth relationships. Okay? That's kind of a weird way to say that. But you know what? Speaking the truth in love is hard to do just right here in this room. It does happen, and I'm, and, and I'm glad it happens, and it needs to happen. It needs to happen more. But it shouldn't just happen in this room. This should be taking place over lunch, dinner, play dates, game nights, all sorts of interactions. Every time you connect, connect, that idea of supporting connections. When you connect, you speak the truth. So let's gather together somehow into smaller groups. Okay, now we do have small groups. Some Bible studies, ladies' Bible studies, men's Bible studies. We have growth groups. And all these are, are to facilitate, okay, discipleship relationships. They're to provide that support and care. And then to facilitate these discipleship relationships that can be ongoing within the body. And then also the loving unity of the whole body. We've got to promote the loving unity of the whole body because it's within that context that this all happens. It's the greenhouse of where loving and speaking the truth happen, growth happens. All right. Let's pray together this morning. And let's, let's go to God and let's ask him, okay, are we, are we committed? Disciples. Are we committed to discipleship? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the book of Ephesians. Lord, it's challenged my heart. I pray that it's challenged our church. Lord, I ask that you'd help our church to grow into maturity. That we would not be blown about by every wave, knocked around by twisted doctrine, by cunning human craftiness, but rather that we would speak the truth in love with one another, build each other up, stabilize one another, and see you doing a great work within our body. Lord, we need you. We need you to do this. You are the head from whom all of this happens and to whom all the glory belongs. Now to him who's able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for coming this morning. You are dismissed.